Сука, бля! Hello everyone. I have to get to the point right away. I'm trying to keep the video short because I have to be a part of the fast consumption culture in order to find a place in the sector. Our topic today is Russia. Of course, I cannot explain such a wide subject in one breath. The parts I will tell will be mostly about the babushka culture. Babushka culture was the connection with Turkish and Balkan culture. I want to talk a little bit about this. Of course, I will talk about the Soviet period, Slavic culture, Russian history in general. There will be a unity, but there will be no boring topics like wars or political history. We'll have a lot of fun. I'm sure you come across Slavic memes. It's a fun society. My personal opinion is that they have a strangeness very close to the strangeness of us Turks. That's why I sympathize with them, I guess. Anyway, I'm from Tekirda, friends. I'm in Thracian. Therefore, I can say that I was heavily influenced by the Balkan culture of life. My dad had a lot of Bulgarian friends. The more I research, the more I realize that our daily life is very similar to the culture of life in the Balkans. There are common features such as the streets being very noisy and family elders, especially our grandmothers, having a very important place. This grandmother culture is also something that exists in Russia. There is already a grandmother in my picture right now. So, babushka means grandmother in Russian. So that's it? Why she is so valuable? Let me tell you a bit about it now. I'm starting from the beginning. We are going back to the history of the Russians, the Slavs. Russians were first mentioned in the 9th century. In this period, of course, there was no such thing as a Russian state. There are Slavic peoples. These peoples live in the area covering today's Russia and Ukraine. The Russian identity is formed by these Slavic peoples and Normans. The Slavs are divided into West Slavs, East Slavs and South Slavs. Croats, Bosniaks, Serbs, Montenegrin and Bulgarians constitute the South Slavs and form the Balkan region. In the last century, there was Yugoslavia in this region. Yugo, which means South, combined with Slav means South Slavs. Poles, Czechs and Slovaks are the West Slavs, while Belarusians, Ukrainians and Russians are the East Slavs. In the 9th century, there is a state in Kiev in this region. It's already referred to as the Kievian Russia. The ruler is Rurik of Danish origin. This man organizes expeditions to Constantinople. In this way, he interacts with Byzantium. What does this mean? It means that Byzantine culture started to spread in Russian society for the first time. In the 11th century, there is also unity here. On the continent, Slavs lived together in religious linguistic unity. Until 988, when Vladimir the Great converted to Orthodoxy, these peoples were of course pagans. Vladimir was baptized and married the daughter of the Byzantine Emperor. Russian consciousness started to become synonymous with Orthodox consciousness. In the meantime, Vladimir also reviewed other religions. Since alcohol is forbidden in Islam, he rejected Islam, saying our people cannot give up alcohol. He also rejects Judaism because it lacks a strong political basis. In 1250, with the Mongol invasion, these unions disintegrated because the Mongols scattered all the Slavs under their umbrella. Between 1240 and 1480, they lived under Mongol Turkish rule. During this period, the Moscow region was on the rise. It will be the future Russian state. This political unit strengths during the Mongol period while getting along well with the Mongols. In time, it dominates other states. In 1242, Genghis Khan's grandson founded the Golden Horde state. Moscow fought with the state and the Grand Duchy of Moscow became the leader of the political union of the Russian duchies. When Byzantium fell in 1453, the Russian church separated from the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Moscow became the leader of the Orthodox world. They even regarded themselves as the heir of Byzantium. Also, the coronation ceremonies in the Moscow palace and the clothes of the rulers were 
Byzantinites at that time. I will give a tiny pointer here. There are polemics such as Europeanism, true Christianity. I will talk about it in a moment. The source of that issue is based here. Now let's move on. By the 16th century, the Prince of Moscow was known as the Tsar. Ivan the Terrible is the first Tsar. You should visualize this man right away. There is a work of art, an old man is holding a boy with a split hat in his arms with horror. The person hugging his son with those terrified eyes in Ivan the Terrible. Ivan Fort. 1500s. Russian lands are growing and getting richer. By the way, he himself, including his son, comes from the Rurik dynasty. So far, the rulers have been from the Rurik dynasty. Ivan the Terrible Son is the last Rurik. After him comes the famous Romanov's period. The Tsar and his family, who were killed by the Bolsheviks, also belong to this dynasty. The Romanov period was also full of internal revolts and corruption, as the borders of the state expanded and the bureaucracy developed, corruption increased. There was a heavy tax burden on the peasants. Of course, in the 17th century there was a very important Tsar called Insane Petro, who was also very important for Russians. Europeans call him Pedro the Great. We Turks call him Insane Petro. At the beginning of the 18th century, he made the westernization move that the Ottomans formalized with the Tanzimat Edict of 1839. He traveled around Europe and brought everything he saw useful to his country. He laid the foundation of modern Russia by taking decisions in the fields of education, administration, dress, navy, science and technology. He forbids growing a bird. He is very serious about it. He introduced the idea of being European to the upper stratum of society. I remember from Dostoevsky's novels that at such lavish parties, noble guests would intersperse French wars in their speeches. Then the Romanov period ends. When we come to the World War I period in 1905, Russia is a very large landmass and therefore very difficult to govern. It could not maintain order with itself. The Bolsheviks said, this war is an imperial war and the Russian Zodom is an imperial state. The same imperialism is exploiting our workers and peasants. When the February Revolution took place, the First World War was going on. When the provisional government wanted to continue the war with Germany, the Bolsheviks and other socialist groups mobilized for the withdrawal of this decision. If we talk about the palace administration, the last representatives of the Romanovs were Russian Tsar Nicholas II and his family including 65 foreign members. 47 of them fled. The rest were shot by the Bolsheviks in Yekaterinburg. With the Bolshevik Revolution, the Soviet Union was established under the leadership of Lenin, which ruled between 1922 and 1991. A period that the definition of heaven for some and hell for other begins. Our nostalgia level is increasing at full throttle. Everyone get their vodka and Russian has ready. Most Russian citizens feel nostalgic about the Soviet era. In a survey conducted in 2018, 66% of Russians said they were sad that the Soviet Union collapsed. According to a 2020 survey, 75% of Russians said that the Soviet era was the best period in the country's history. Was it really the greatest period? It's debatable. The state decides every aspect of your life. You have to choose the department you study at university as a profession. The state sends you to perhaps the farthest corner of the country according to the department you studied because there is a need for you there. You cannot say no to the state because it's forbidden. Let's say you refuse to work. After four months, the state sends you to a labor camp within the scope of the social parasitizing crime. At least there is no unemployment problem on the bright side. 
You don't worry about the future. You don't have anxiety attacks at night like here. University departments are opened according to need. Your job is ready as soon as you graduate. The only bad thing is that you cannot reject the life the state has chosen for you. As your job is ready, your home is also ready. I'll tell you about Soviet houses, although it's depressing. I love it very much. I think I feel a sense of belonging because it's similar to the apartment desert in our country. There are public lodgings called Komunarka there. There are 5 to 6 rooms in a house. There are 25 to 30 Kwamita rooms. Different families live in each of these rooms. Since these houses are small, they are perfect for thermal insulation. So, how do you enter this house? You apply to the committee of the place where you work. You wait in this lodging house until the state gives you a house. This wait lasts one or five years. Then the state gives you your house and you live in this house until you die. You pay 5% of your monthly salary to the state for the house, including gas and utility bills. For example, you earn between 150 to 200 rubles. As a worker, you own a house by giving 15 rubles. Someone who cannot find accommodation, the state puts them in your house as a tenant. And you have no right to say no. Here is a, such a benevolent state. Also, when you die, you cannot inherit your house. The state takes it and gives it to someone else. No one is left homeless. As for social life, the state attaches great importance to unity. Events such as theater, cinema, opera are approved by the state. There are discourses that prize the state and its system and strengthen its continuity. In general, a perception is created that other countries are trying to divide us, but we are very strong. Western content is also reorganized and the public is kept isolated from the outside world. Everything is domestically produced and the same standard brand is everywhere in the country. There is no variety and different quality. The outside world is unaware of the Soviets and the Soviets are unaware of the outside world. All of them are actually measures taken to maintain order. Order within the family, the smallest social structure is also protected. Marriages are controlled. Newlyweds are expected to have children and start a family immediately. You can't divorce on your own. Both men and women are integrated by the committees of their workplaces. Divorce is considered a shame, the most disgraceful thing. The state is paranoid about its citizens. A KCB agent lives in every apartment block. There are informants everywhere. If your appearance is slightly different, you arouse suspicion and your house is raided. You are investigated. Imagine if I had lived in Soviet period, I would have been ruined, my hair would have been pink. Because people are expected to be uniform individuals in order to prevent the Soviet system from disintegrating. Naturally, in large political communities, the same voice from every head must come out sustainability. The characteristic of the ideal Soviet citizens are clear to state, obedient, hardworking, socialist, altruistic, uncritical. In Soviet society, if you are a university professor or a doctor, people look at you as a noble. I watched a film called Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears set in Soviet times. For example, it tells this one-to-one. -one. Of course, if you are a member of the Communist Party and attend all the meetings, you advance in the career gradually. Even if you are a talented professor or scientist, if you are not a party member, you cannot advance in the career. Flattery is beyond everything. For example, this is one of the most important reasons for the Soviet collapse. While party members live in palaces, buy foreign currency, go abroad and live in wealth, the people are in this state. 
The people know this, of course, but they ignore it. Scientists flee the country because they don't want to act according to political ideology. Also, since the Soviets closed themselves to the outside world, they could not interact with the developments in the world. By the 90s, it was already about to collapse. We can't say that their golden period actually coincides with the World War II period, because the role played by the Soviets during World War II was very big. Hitler entered Poland despite the German-Soviet non-aggression pact. Soviet soldiers go to the front against the Nazis. Do you know a song called Katyusha? This song is Katyusha, the Russian woman who waited for the brave Soviet man who died in World War II and was grateful to him for defending her homeland and said that she would always be faithful to him. Millions of Katyushas are widowed. The song was first sung by female students at the Soviet Industrial School in Moscow in 1938. Then it was popularized when the Nazis attacked it. In 1941, Hitler attacked Soviet territory. At the siege of Leningrad, Hitler fails because America joins the war. Hitler escapes in 1940 and the Russians advance into Germany. They enter as far as Berlin. There is a famous photograph again. A Soviet soldier stands on top of a building and raises the Soviet flag. Then Germany is divided. I will put that part in another video. East Germany, West Germany. For Soviet Russia, this is the most important unifying event in history. It remains in their historical memory as the Great Patriotic War. In 1944, until America and England opened their second front, the Soviets fought the Nazis alone in Europe. They considered themselves the defenders of freedom and democracy in Europe. We saved the world from the Nazis. Of course, after the Baltic countries and Poland declared their independence from the USSR, they said Stalin is to us what the Nazis were to us. They think that their lands were subjected to Soviet occupation. They saved them from the war, but they dictate their own regime. Obviously, the media does not present it in this way. In an uncertain period after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there is a film set in the slums of Estonia called Lilia Forever. It's really the most heartbreaking film I've ever seen in my life. You feel the Soviet apartments, people's dreams of escaping the country, poverty and abandonment to your bones. I was cold while watching that film. The walls covered with wallpaper and carpet, cigarette butts on the tables, all kinds of small little things everywhere. I mean, people live there, close to each other. The lived experience is vegetation of the film. I recommend you to watch it. Anyway, then in 1945, America set up with an ATO. American missiles are stationed in Europe against a possible Soviet advance. In the 1970s, Soviet Russia reached its final frontiers. Then they entered the space race with America. Until 1985, purchasing poor is good. After 1985, it ends with the Gorbachev era. In 1991, the same night Gorbachev resigned, the red flag in the Kremlin was lowered and the Russian flag was raised. In 1999, until Putin came to power, there was a terrible, confused period. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian state is in search of identity and ideology. Looking back to the past, we have the following materials. The Tsarist Empire, Orthodoxy, Soviet Russia and its role as a gendarme of Europe in World War II. For one thing, an imperial structure like Tsarist Russia and Soviet Russia are diametrically opposed. This makes the construction of historical identity difficult. Tsarist Russia explained Russian identity as being orthodox and the heir of Byzantium and wanted to patronize the world orthodox and unite all Slavs. 
Soviet Russia, on the other hand, wants to lead the people of the Eastern Bloc against capitalism with the concepts of equality and freedom. The 19th century poet Fyodor Tuyutchev does not say for nothing. Russia cannot be understood by the mind, it cannot be measured by the cupids, it's unique. Russia just like us is in fact neither fully Western nor fully Eastern. It's a unique civilization. It has both an imperial past and a multinational Soviet past. Logically, the concept of great power and leadership is the only unifying concept that can be chosen. Putin uses this mentality very well, but Boris Yeltsin, the founder of the Russian Federation, excludes Soviet and Marxist understand from the structure. In his own words, the Soviet totalitarian regime has collapsed and Russia is now on its way to its natural, historical and cultural continuity. As if the Soviet period was an intermediate period that undermined Russia's identity. Yeltsin perceives the Soviet collapse as Russia's return to its home in Europe. I mentioned this European discourse at the beginning of the video. I talk about the elite knowing French and inserting it between sentences in daily life. Tsarist Russia saw itself as a part of the European continent. It was also afraid of being isolated, the opposite of Soviet Russia. In the 16th century, the Moscow prince declared itself as the continuation of Byzantium, the Third Rome or something like that. We have claimed the legacy of Rome. Nicholas I said of the West, it has lost the essence of Christianity, the true Westerner is Russia. Yeltsin is also trying to use this discourse of Europeanization, Great Russia. Of course, the economic crisis in the 90s, the rise in crime, rate with political importance and the mixed atmosphere make the Great Russian nation discourse not convincing at all. This Europeanization was already in decline when Putin arrived. In the second half of the 90s, liberalism was replaced by the ideal of centrist patriotism. The people want a strong and authoritarian government. After Russia cancelled its debt to the EMF and became Europe's largest energy exporter, it completely abandoned this European Russia discourse. After that, especially during the Putin era, all the good values of Russia were adopted. All powerful figures defending their country, even if they contradict each other, are put into the same picture and served to the public in that way. In 1998, the bodies of that last representatives of the Romanovs, the Tsar and his family were buried in St. Petersburg Cathedral in a ceremony attended by Yeltsin. In 2000, they were declared signs. The erection of the statue of Peter in 1997 was another move to revive the pre-Soviet memory. The double-headed eagle used in the Tsarist, Tsarist period was made the state coat of arms. The white, blue, red flag of Peter's era is again used as a national flag. Lyrics were added to the Soviet anthem and it became the national anthem. All this shows that a unity is being reached in the Russian historical identity. Zamat Russia, which means for Mother Russia, I need to explain to you. How we say Anatolia, we pronounce it as Anadolu in Turkish. It means full of mothers. Just like this, Russians like their country to a mother. While the Tsar represents the father, the mother represents the permanent and strong state. This is also the reason for the importance and value Orthodox people attach Virgin Mary. When I think of Russia, the first thing that comes to my mind is an old woman. I think the reason for this comes from the character read in the series Orange is a New Black. What did that character teach me about Russians? Self-sacrifice, the happiness of feeding their children, the sacredness of the concept of family, harsh temperament. There is a girl I follow called Katrina who constantly talks about a mother-daughter relationship in Russia in her videos, like women being tougher, more fatherly than men. She talks a lot about mothers being the head of the family. You may know Chris Collins, there is an imaginary Russian woman character played by Hub, and this imaginary woman has a history as a KGB agent. She is alcoholic 
angry and although her children are very young they are very skillful and have hacking skill children are really raised very differently in russia than in turkey raised Children are really raised very differently in Russia than in Turkey. I listened to this in Karina Inal's video. She mentioned that the mothers were very strict and at a young age, boys and girls could easily see the housework. Boys and girls could easily do the housework. Even a 7-year-old child can go to the hospital and get a prescription by himself. He said that the reason for this was that the mother and father work two jobs. At home, it's usually the grandmother, the babushka, who takes care of the children. The head of the family is also the babushka, the most respected elder. Interestingly, Turkish and Russian are two of the richest languages in terms of kinship. In both languages, for example, the word ana, I mean mom, mother is used to address older women with whom there is no kinship. The female figure is also very important in Russian folklore. In Siberian shaman culture, woman is the source of shaman power. Women are very important in shamans. The female figure plays an important role in both Turkish and Russian folk literature. Makosh is the oldest Slavic goddess. Dililia is the goddess of fertility just like Umay. Umay is the spirit that protects women and children. In both folklore, women are strong, alpine, valiant. They fight together with their men. After Islam and Christianity came, the situation of course changed. The Christianized Russian woman becomes a part of the house, a person who listens to the men. After Islamic culture, the woman is in the second plan. She becomes a figure mentioned only in love conversations. For example, there is Baba Yaga in Russian mythology, a character equivalent to our Alkarisa. While she was a wise, healing sorceress before Christianity, after Christianity she enters the narrative as an old, ugly, kidnapping character. In Russian folk literature, a woman who obeys is characterized as a good woman. As for the beautiful woman, her face is white, her cheeks are pink, her eyebrows black like a crow, her eyes bright like stars, her posture like a swan, her gait like a peacock. There is a such an image. Of course, since they are orthodox, being a mother is always sacred. It's the same for Russians, the same for the Balkans, the same for Turkey. To summarize, I have a common image in my mind for all of us. An, an elderly woman with a cheese cloth on her head, baking buns. In this painting, I wanted to create a Russian image based on the bond of love between a young Russian belonging to the Gopnik culture, which enters everyone's lives with Slavic memes and his babushka. Gopniks are actually like people living in the slums in Turkey. They are also perceived that way in Russia. A quarrelsome type who walks in parks, consumes vodka and seeds, squats on the ground, wears Adidas tracksuit and boots. I have not yet come across a serious article about the Gopniks, but there is a YouTube channel that conveys that structure one to one, Life of Boris. I will add it to the description anyway. For, an, for example, uh, Russians are superstitious people and they gather behind people who are traveling and throw water. I think it's a nice detail. Leave the source of this in the explanation section. If you have friends who live or have lived in Russia, if you have Bulgarian immigrants, Greek immigrants, be sure to write your own traditions in the comments. I'm very curious. If I have made a wrong transfer, if I have given wrong information, I would be glad if you correct me. I hope it was a pleasant video. I hope it was a pleasant video. I would like to add one last thing. I had friends who said that I choose a very risky topic due to agenda. I don't want to be labeled as if I'm praising Russia because of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I find such a view shallow. I don't think that divorce are in the eyes of the Russian people or the Ukrainian people. 
These are things that are completely decided by the state authority. Each authority. It should not spread to the social structure and cultural wealth of the people. I don't think it's right to take a militaristic view. Maybe I'm childish, I don't know. I wish there was peace everywhere and nobody would harm anyone. Anyway, stay with love.